Good morning. It's good to be here this morning. And uh, as we begin our phase one reopening of, of services, and so for the few of you who are here this morning, we're glad you're here. And we can't wait for the rest of our members to, to fill up the seats. In the meantime, thank you for watching with us through our live stream. We pray, pray that you are encouraged each week as we spend time together in worship and in God's Word, which is what we're going to do today. So let me encourage you to stand as we lift up our voices in praise and worship to God, because truly our God is forever with us, and he, His love endures forever. So let's sing of that great love of God this morning. Oh, 
God is forever faithful. He, he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's with us always, even until the end of the world. He's forever faithful. Even when we are faithless, he is forever faithful. He is forever strong. You know what? We can lean on him when we're worn out and tired. He, he is a strong arm that we can lean on and support us. And I'm so glad for that today. This morning, let's just hear from God's word. Uh, Psalm 136. And the psalm says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who alone does great wonders, his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the heavens with skill, his loving kindness is is everlasting to him who spread out the earth above the waters his loving kindness is everlasting to him who made the great lights his loving kindness is everlasting the sun to rule by day for his loving kindness is everlasting and the moon and the stars to rule by night his loving kindness is everlasting did you pick up the theme in that psalm God's loving kindness, his loyal, steadfast love never runs out on us. And we have so much to be thankful for today, just for his loving kindness, just for his faithfulness to us, just for the fact that he is our refuge and strength. He's our very present help in trouble. We can run to him and find safety and security in the presence of God. What we want to do this morning is just commit our time to the Lord as we continue singing praises to God that he would be honored and magnified and that he, as we gather in his presence, would meet us at the point of our need. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning and commit our time to the Lord and we'll continue singing praises to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, this morning we come before you and we thank you. We thank you, Father, for your loving kindness. For truly, your loving kindness is everlasting. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. For your faithfulness is not dependent upon us. You are faithful. And you display your faithfulness in our lives day by day, moment by moment. And for that, we thank you. Father, we thank you for your protection over our lives. We thank you for your provision to us. You are faithful, and we praise you today. Father, we thank you because you have demonstrated your love for us by sending your Son, Jesus Christ, into this world. And your Son displayed his love for us by giving his life for us on the cross, doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. He died in our place, and for that today we give you praise, that we are now, we who have placed our faith and trust in your son Jesus Christ, are your children, your sons and daughters. We have your name, and we praise you today. Father, we thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit, and surely your presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit is in this place today. You are here to meet us at the point of our needs. And Father, as we gather in your presence today, Father, would you meet us at the point of our needs? You know what we stand in need of. Father, there is absolutely nothing that is hidden from you. Our lives are but an open book before you. And so, Father, as we gather in your presence today, would you meet us at the point of our needs in only a way that you know how? And Father, we will give you praise. We will give you worship. We will honor you, for you are worthy. Thank you, Father, for meeting us here today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue singing about the beautiful one who loves us and who has shown us his love, and he is worthy of our praise. Let's sing together this morning. I have 
sings the beauty and majesty of the Lord. He is worthy of our praise this morning. Uh, we are in the home stretch of our series on the, on the Psalms. We've been looking at the Psalms to find um, reminders of who God is during these difficult times. And as we find reminders of who God is during these difficult times, we can find hope, we can find encouragement uh, to uh, Make that next step to endure during these difficult times. This morning, we are going to look at Psalm 118. Psalm 118. And today our focus, as we look at Psalm 118, is the Lord who loves. The Lord who loves. And what we want to celebrate this morning is God's amazing love for us. He loved us. The Bible communicates over and over to us the amazing, steadfast, loyal love of our God towards us. Psalm 118 celebrates God's love for his people. He manifests his love in our lives through his comfort for us, through his provision for us, through his protection of us, through his encouragement, and through his blessings. God manifests his love for each one of us. For Christians, we who have placed our faith and trust in, tr in Jesus Christ, God's love for us is demonstrated most clearly by Him sending His one and only Son into the world to come into, to take on human flesh, to walk amongst sinful humanity, and to die on the cross for us. That is the most 
vivid demonstration, the most clear demonstration of God's love for mankind by sending his son to die in our place. I believe Job understood uh, the truth of the love of God when Job declared this, and he got it right. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This psalm that we're going to look at this morning reminds us of all that God has given to each one of us. And it invites us, as we look at the psalm, it invites us to approach the throne of God, to approach the Lord with thankful hearts. Because of his love that he has demonstrated to us, we come before him with hearts full of gratitude and thankfulness for who he is and for all that he has done. Let me just give you a little bit of context uh, as we prepare to dig into Psalm 118 this morning. Uh, Really contextually, to set this up for us, Uh, What we find in this text are some battle-weary soldiers being led by their victorious king back into Jerusalem and the temple of God after uh, God has given them a military victory. So this is really the context. They are, God has given them a military victory and they are headed back into Jerusalem. They are headed back to the temple to worship and give praise to God for giving them this great military victory. Dr. Tom Constable, one of my uh, professors that I had at Dallas Seminary, he says this, this psalm teaches us much about the Messiah, but its primary significance, as the Israelites used it originally, was glorifying God for providing deliverance. This deliverance came after a period of evident defeat. Here is the situation. It looked like every it looked like they were going to lose. Every way every way they turned, what they saw was defeat. But God turned the tables around for them so that they could do nothing but praise God. When it looked like all they were going to do was fail, when it looked like they were, all they were going to experience was defeat, God turned the tables and gave them victory. And as a result of the victory that God gave them, their hearts overflowed with praise to God. Psalm 113 Uh, through Psalm 118, um, they form what is called uh, the Hallel Psalms. Hallel means praise. Where we get our word hallelujah, hallel, that means, hallelujah means to praise Yahweh. These are the Hallel Psalms. Psalm 113 through 118 form the Hallel Psalms, the praise psalms. And so as you read Psalm 113 through 118, what you'll find over and over in those psalms are psalms of praise to God. This morning, as we look at Psalm 118, when we experience God's love, we will see the psalmist respond in actually two ways we'll see in this psalm. And as we read this psalm, we're encouraged to do the same thing. I want to summarize this psalm in two sentences as we look at the text this morning. First, first, show others when you experience God's love. Show others when you've experienced God's love. Let's look at the text, verses 1 through 14 of Psalm 118. Psalm 118, verses 1 through 14. Let's read this morning. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let Israel say, His loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let the house of Aaron say, His loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let those who fear the Lord say, His loving kindness is everlasting. For my distress I called upon the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is for me, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surround me. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. 
they were extinguished as a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. You pushed me violently so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Show others when, when you have experienced the steadfast, loyal love of God. When we experience the amazing love of God, our responsibility is to show others. What we see in this text this morning in verses 1 through 4, what we see in verses 1 through 4 is a call to worship. The psalmist begins this psalm with a call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. That is a call to worship. He is encouraging all of Israel, and he is encouraging us, likewise, to come together to lift up our voices and give thanks to the Lord because we have experienced his great love. This call to worship that the psalmist gives us in Psalm 118, verses 1 through 4, is a call to acknowledge God's loving kindness towards us. And then the psalmist appealed to all of Israel. Then he, he goes through it in verses 1 through 4. He appeals to all of Israel. He appeals to the priests. And then he appeals to all those who fear the Lord, who acknowledge the limitless quality of the love of, the love of God. He goes through, he leaves no one uncovered. From the priest to those who just come to church. From the pastors to those who are just church. He says, give thanks to the Lord because we have experienced his great love. All but five verses give us the covenant name of God in this text. When you read verses, uh, Psalm 118, all verses except for five use the covenant name for God, Yahweh, the covenant name for God. So when you read through this, there are uh, 29 verses in Psalm 118. 24 verses use the name, the covenant name of God, Yahweh. 28 out of 29, verse, 28 times out of 29 verses, the psalmist uses the covenant name for God. God's covenant people are to worship him because he loved us with a loyal, steadfast love. What he meant was to remind the readers of God's faithful covenant love. As he used the covenant name for God, Yahweh, it was to remind those who read this psalm, who sang this psalm, of the faithful covenant love of God for his people. God's deliverance of them militarily proved that he was a covenant-keeping God. And as they praise him, and as the psalmist used the covenant name of God, even in this military victory, it shows God's covenant love for them, that God is a covenant-keeping God. When you look at verse 5, when you look at verse 5, he starts out in verses 1 through 4 of, of encouraging people to, they calling people to worship God for his great love that he has demonstrated to them. And then you get to verse 5. Verse 5 says, For my distress I called upon the Lord, and he answered me, and he set me in a large place. He, he is, what we see in verse 5 is a surprising victory. Here it is, as he's looking, uh, the psalmist is remembering the, the, the great love of God. He, his mind goes back to when all they had experienced was failure and defeat. And he says in verse 5, For my distress, from my distress, as I looked around me and all I saw was failure and defeat, from that place I called upon God and he heard me and he answered me and he set me in a large place. What is he saying? God gave me a victory. When all I saw was defeat, when all I saw was de failure, God stepped in and showed us victory. What you may not see in this, uh, in verse 5, there is a shift in verse 5. As you see, verses 1 through 4, there is a corporate call to worship. And then in verse 5, there is a shift to a single person speaking. Who is that single person speaking? That single person speaking is Israel's king. Remember, when this psalm was written, kings did not just send uh, their military into battle. The king led 
their military into battle. And so here is the king of Israel saying, when all I looked around and saw was failure and defeat, I cried out to the Lord and he heard me and he answered me and he stepped in, turned the tables around and gave us victory. Here he was with the people on the battlefront. And we see that in verses 8 through 9. He's talking about being in battle and how he's being surrounded. Here he is, the king of Israel, with his military on the battlefront. And now as he's thinking back, now he's giving a personal testimony of God's deliverance of him. That God answered his prayer. What is he saying? God alone is worthy of our praise. It was not my military skill. It was not my strength. But it was God alone who delivered us. And he is worthy of our praise. How often is it do we take credit for the things that God alone is worthy of? Well, you know, I, I, I got myself out of debt. You know, I, I saved and I did this and I did this. We use I so much when we should be giving God the praise because were it not for God, we wouldn't have a job. Were it not for God, we wouldn't have any of the things that we have today and we take credit for those things. I worked hard. How often do we hear that? We need to give praise to God. God is worthy of the praise. And that's what we see in this psalm. The psalmist is recognizing that it is God who gave him a military victory. And God alone is worthy of the praise. We give credit. We can give credit to so many others. But when you really stop and think about it, the credit belongs to God. Don't look at me, the psalmist is saying. Look at God. Don't look at me. Don't think I'm all, all this in a bag of chips. Don't look at me, but look at God. Because if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, give praise to God. It's God's great love for me. What we are called to do in this psalm is to show others when we experience God's love. How often is it we keep it to ourselves? We keep silent. We experience God's love in our lives. We experience God's faithfulness in our lives. And instead of giving a testimony of God's faithful love to us, we keep silent. What this psalm is encouraging us to do is that when we experience God's love, when we experience God's faithfulness, when God steps in and turns the table, when we should have experienced defeat and he gives us victory, what we are to do is to be a witness of the faithfulness and the love of God. Show others when you experience God's love. That's what this psalm calls us to do second sentence I would use to summarize this psalm and I think sometimes we struggle with this one too and that is to say thank you when you experience God's love many of us struggle saying thank you when someone blesses us let alone saying thank you to God when we experience his love his faithful provision in our lives this psalm is encouraging us to say thank you when we experience God's love. Let's look at this text, verses 15 through 29. Verses 15 through 29 of Psalm 118. The psalmist says, The sound of joyful shouting and salvation in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I will not die but live and tell of the works of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. I shall give thanks to you, and for you have answered me. And you have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes that this, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, do save, we beseech you. 
O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God. I give thanks to you. For you are my God. I extol you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Say thank you when you experience God's love. What we see in this text right here in verses 15 through 29 is that the military being led by the king is headed back into Jerusalem and they didn't just come into the gates of Jerusalem and have the people celebrate the victory. They went straight to the temple of God to give thanks to God for giving them that victory. In verses 25 through 26 of Psalm 118, as you look at that text, the psalmist says, O Lord, save us, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Does, do those verses sound familiar to you as you think of what is written in the New Testament? Well, all four Gospels record these verses being used by the people as Jesus entered into Jerusalem. We call that the triumphal entry. As Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, because that's how the king rode back from, he rode out of the city on a horse because he was going into battle. And if he had a military victory, he rode back into the city on a donkey. What we see in the New Testament is all four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all record these verses of Jesus as Jesus rides into the city of Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, a military victory, bringing peace to the people. The people cried out these words. They said, Hosanna. What does that mean? Save us. They, they cried out Yahweh, or Lord, which is the covenant name of God. We see this in both the Old and the New Testament. Speaking of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Here they were coming to worship at the temple, and they were crying out to God. Here in this psalm, the military had experienced a victory. The king is riding into the city, and he leads the people to the temple to give thanks to God for giving them a victory. When you read in the New Testament parallel to this passage the messiah rides into jerusalem the king the victorious king riding into jerusalem headed to the temple giving praise to god for who he is and for all he's done let's look at verse 30 27 let's look at verse 27 verse 27 says the lord is god he has given us light bind the festival sacrifice with cords uh, to the horns of the altar. He, he speaks of this worship, giving back to God praise, giving back to God. God has given to us victory, and what we do in turn is give praise to God. We see that even in the New Testament as Jesus is riding. Jesus, the Messiah, is riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. They didn't uh, offer up a sacrifice because the sacrifice itself was riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. But what did they do? They picked up palm branches and they waved them and they sang because of the sacrifice, the demonstration of love. We know Jesus, the Messiah. The text continues. I'm jumping around a little bit, but just follow with me. Back, Look back at verse 23. Look back at uh, verse 23. And he says, This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Uh, no, let's jump back. I jumped down too far. Go back up to verse 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Again, speaking of 
the Messiah. What is that cornerstone? Well, uh, one commentator says this of the cornerstone. The cornerstone of a building was the most important stone in the foundation. Why? Because all other foundation stones were aligned in reference to to that cornerstone when we get to the new testament jesus is described as the chief cornerstone the stones that the builders rejected who were well those were the pharisees they rejected jesus they rejected jesus as the chief cornerstone he is the chief cornerstone in the foundation upon which we align our lives we walk in, how, how, a better way to put that is we walk in the footsteps of Jesus. We align our lives to the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. The builders rejected that chief cornerstone entirely. When we get to the New Testament and you read in the New Testament writers and they speak of Jesus, they rejected that chief cornerstone entirely. How do we know they rejected the chief cornerstone entirely? Well, they beat him. They placed a crown of thorns on his head. They nailed him to a cross, and they killed him. They rejected Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. They had no intention to use Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. They had no intention of aligning their lives with Christ. The psalmist uses this image to show that God has reversed their circumstances by, by delivering them when the battle looked lost. He uses this in this text for, for the, to get, give you context in this psalm. The psalmist is using this to say that when all hope seemed to be lost, God turned it around for us. We get to the New Testament. When all hope seems to be lost, God sent his son, Jesus Christ. And as Christ gave his life, for us in the new testament actually both peter and paul apply this verse this verse from psalm 118 is applied by both peter and paul to jesus christ so for those that are saying that jesus christ is not the messiah you have to look the bible gives context for itself so we have old testament uh passages that point to the messiah then we have new testament writers who look back to the old testament and tie it together in jesus christ the psalmist says that the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone it was a psalm of praise then peter and paul look back and grab that verse and say no the stone that the builders rejected is jesus christ he is our messiah the one that you crucified who was buried and who was raised from the dead. He is the chief cornerstone. We see the New Testament bringing all this together. There is seamless connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We can't throw out one for the other. They're tied together. Jesus himself applies this verse, Psalm 22, to himself. Five days before he was to die on the cross in Matthew 21, describes for us the, uh, the triumphal entry. And Matthew 21 ends with Jesus quoting Psalm 118, verse 22. Jesus applies that verse to himself. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Jesus applied it to himself. So we see Peter and Paul applying this, this verse to Jesus, and then Jesus applies it to himself. He is the Messiah sent by God to take away the sins of the world, to die on the cross for us. Psalm 118 gets explained by Matthew 21. Matthew 21 ex gives illumination to us of what the psalmist is writing in Psalm 118. It is the stone that the Jewish leaders had rejected. They rejected Jesus Christ. He was that chief cornerstone, and they rejected him. Evident defeat but reversal of fortune they rejected him they crucified him and one would have thought that that was the end and that there was defeat but there was a reversal of fortune because he rose from the dead with power and victory let's look at verses 18 through 20 Psalm 118 
There's so much in this passage. I'm just trying to give you the highlights of it this morning as we celebrate and give praise to God for his love for us. Look at verses 18 through 20. And in this passage right there in verses 18 through 20, uh, the, the psalmist, the king, asks for permission to enter the gates. Do you see it there? Uh, in verse 18, he says, The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. The Lord has disciplined me. I've, I've experienced some, some defeats, but I am not dying. Then he says in verse 19, Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. So the king asks for permission. He says, open up the gates. Would you guys open up the gates so that I can enter in and give praise to God? Actually, five times the psalmist uh, uh, speaking is giving thanks to God. When you start reading through it and he begins these sections, he speaks of giving thanks to God over and over and over again. As we have experienced God's mighty victories in our lives, as we have experienced God's faithfulness in our lives, as we as we have experienced God's protection and provision and his love, what we are to do over and over and over again is to give praise to God. That's the theme of the psalm. And so up until that point, they were speaking of the Lord in the third person. Give you a little bit of a grammar lesson. So up until this point, if you're reading the psalm, they had been speaking of the Lord in the third person. So whenever they spoke of the Lord, they said him, him, him. His, him. They speak of the Lord in the third person. Then there is a shift when you get to verse 19, when he says, Open for me the gates of righteousness, that I will enter through them, and I shall give thanks to the Lord. So there is a shift there in, in grammar, and it switches from the third person to the second person. They go from using him and his to you. This is a picture, really, uh, if we want to find a, a New Testament uh, picture. Uh, this is a new a picture of the the one leper that returned to Jesus after Jesus finds those lepers and and he heals them and he tells them to go show themselves to the priest and only one returned to give thanks to God to say thank you and this is that picture here that we enter into God's presence face to face one with God and we offer thanks to him for who he is and for all that he has done. And the question for us this morning, the question we need to wrestle with is do we thank God? Do we thank God with our lips? Do we open up our mouths and say, God, I thank you for your provision. God, I thank you for your protection. If it had not been for you on my side, I don't know what I would, what, where I would be. So God, I thank you. We should be living instruments of praise to God for who he is and for all that he has done our lips should speak praise to God do you say thank you to God with your mouth and the second question does your life say thank you to God does your life say thank you to God do I live with gratitude and thankfulness to God giving God the praise for all that he has done in my life He's done so much for us. We used to sing growing up, He's done so much for me, I cannot tell it all. He's done so much for us. He is worthy of, our, of the praise that we offer up to Him. Let's just look real quickly. You can write this down and look at it later. So, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. And Paul writes, and he says this, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose on their behalf. Paul helps us to see that a little bit more clearly. Because Christ died for us, and he demonstrated, he was the, the, the literal demonstration of God's love for us by dying on the cross for us. We who have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ's work on the cross, all that we can do is offer and live lives of thankfulness and gratitude to him for what he has done. He's done so much for us. We give praise. 
Matthew and Mark both record verses from Psalm 118. Hours before Jesus' death, before he was to be crucified, and in both in Matthew and in Mark, where we read um, how Jesus instituted uh, the Lord's table, the communion, with his disciples in the upper room. Each of these writers record that after they had shared the bread and the cup, what did they do? They sang a hymn together before they went out to the Mount of Olives. Tradition has it that this, Psalm 118, is the hymn that they sang together. And so, just think about it with me. So, here they are, here they are, God, Jesus is with them, and he gives them the bread, says, take, eat, this is my body, which is given to you, drink, this is my blood, which is given for you. And then they sang a hymn. The hymn they sang was Psalm 118, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. This is the psalm that they sang, the hymn that the disciples sang with Jesus. This is what tradition says. This is the, the hymn that Jesus and his disciples sang after the institution of the Lord's table. What a great hymn to sing, because shortly after that, Jesus is going to demonstrate fully his love for us by dying on the cross in our place. So how do we apply this psalm this morning? Psalm 118 which speaks of the great love of God towards us. How do we apply this psalm? Well, first, I've got five applications for us this morning. The first, I've asked this same question each week. First question for you to wrestle with is, how is your soul today? Is your soul weary, distressed? Are you, your soul defeated? Or are you crying out to God? and experiencing his victory in your life. How's your soul today? Second question for us to think about. How do you celebrate God's unfailing love for you? How do we celebrate God's unfailing love for us? Do we speak of the unfailing love? Are we giving witness to the unfailing love of God? Are we testifying of what God has done in our lives? How do we celebrate? God's unfailing love. Third, do you blame God for life's storms but take credit for the victories? I think this is a trap that many of us fall into. We point the finger at God and say, why did you allow this? Why am I going through this? But when we experience a victory, man, you know, I worked so hard and if I hadn't done this, this, and this, I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have made it through. We need to shift that. And give praise to God. Give God the credit for the victories in our lives. Fourth question. Do others know about God's love for you? Have you shared that with others? Do you tell people about the loyal love that you have experienced from God through Jesus Christ? As we give witness to a lost and dying world about God's love for for us, that he sent his son, we are testifying about God's love for us. We need to do that. We shouldn't be silent when we speak about God's love for us. And lastly, does your life say thank you to God? In the way I live each day, do I say thank you to God? As we have experienced God's steadfast, loyal love, we should be telling others about it. We should be loudly proclaiming the great love of God and his faithfulness towards us. As we experience God's love, we should in turn say thank you to God for who he is, for all he has done. How will you respond to God's message to you this morning? We're going to respond this morning with a hymn of response, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Let's stand this morning as we sing of the great love of God towards us with this hymn.
his face away as wounds which are the chosen one bring many sons to glory take credit for the things that God has done in my life. I won't take credit for the things that the credit is so clearly due to him, but I will live a life of thankfulness and gratitude for God, to God, for who he is, for all that he has done. Let me just encourage you as we prepare, as we close this morning, encourage you to spend time in prayer and in God's word as we look forward to our time together next week. Next week we'll finish up this sermon series on the Psalms. We'll be looking at Psalm 145. Psalm 145. And our focus next week will be the Lord we praise. So I encourage you to spend time this week, your devotional time in this week, looking at Psalm 145. And when we gather next week at our time of worship, we'll be uh, focusing on the Lord we praise today, as I shared with you last week, today uh, we began phase one of our um, reopening of on-site worship services, and we had a few who responded and called and and reserved their spot, and we encourage you to do the same thing. Uh, If you are ready to come back and uh, experience on-site worship services with us, I encourage you to call the church office and add your name. To the list of those who are worshiping here today. We are taking those steps to make sure that there is, um, um, what do you call it, um, you're spaced out, and uh, <laughs> I forgot the term, spatial, spatial distancing, thank you, see, the word just slipped out of my mind. So we're, we are making sure that there is social distancing, and so as you call and add your name to the list, um, we will make sure that you are distanced and safe. Even though we're in phase one and and people can come and worship on site, we will continue to live stream our services uh, each week because in phase one, there is no uh, children's ministry during our time. There's no kid worship. There's no nursery or toddler care. So um, 
we'll continue to live stream our services during phase one but we do encourage you uh, to come and worship with us if you can if you fit into that category of being a uh, high risk or you are immunocompromised we encourage you to just stay at home and continue to watch um, online we look forward to the day when we can just all come together in here and and worship together we look forward to it. and we're taking steps to get to that where we can do that safely uh, if you have prayer requests each week, I know that there are those of you that are emailing or calling the church to share your prayer request with us. You can do that. Judy, call Judy. Or you can leave a voicemail if she happens not to be here. But you can also use the e-prayer uh, tab on our church website, and that's a great way for you to uh, share your prayer requests with us. I check those every day, and uh, we put those prayers together, and Judy emails out each week. Um, the prayer list so that we as a church body can be in prayer together lifting up the prayer needs that our uh, that our church members have so i encourage you to do that you can also continue to worship the lord through giving each week you can mail uh, your offerings uh, to the church p.o box which is p.o box 1506 sugarland texas 77478 you can do that each week and uh, that's a safe and secure way to uh, worship the Lord through giving. You can also uh, set up uh, online bill pay through your bank and uh, set that up and your offering uh, check can go to the P.O. Box as well. For those tech-savvy people in our congregation, you can use um, the giving tab on our church website. It is secure, and that's a way for you to also give uh, if uh, the Lord leads you to do so. We encourage you uh, to um, give to the Lord and as a sign of thankfulness for who He is and for what He has done in your lives. That's all we have for today. We thank you for joining us today in worship to God. My prayer is that as you have experienced the great, great love of God in your life, that you in turn will testify of that love and give thanks to God for His love. For He is worthy. So until next week, be blessed and show God's grace to those you see. We'll see you next week, same time, same station. Have a blessed week. See you next week.